morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Richard just said, my name's James Berry, and I'm the Managing Director of the Myers Group of Companies. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the changes that have been going on in our business between the transition of the previous generation and my sister uh, and I coming into the business uh, over the last two or three years. So if I'm going to do the presentation, you'll have to listen to me shamelessly plug the company. So I'll just go through this first. Um, the Myers Group is a manufacturer and supplier of building materials. It's a fourth generation family business, it's solely owned by the Myers family today. Um, we turn over approximately 40 million um, with 350 staff and, and we're based in the most glamorous of places, Huddersfield. Careful. Yeah. <laughs> now the group is made up of three major trading elements. Johnson's Wellfield Quarries, which is a block extraction, aggregate and dimension stone business. Um, Naylor Myers, which is a builder's merchant, with three, sorry, 13 uh, branches spread over Yorkshire. And Ready Mix Huddersfield being um, a Ready Mix concrete business. Um, you can see from this that obviously it's, it's an extremely diverse business. There are potentially a lot of dangerous environments. And we've also got to balance um, not just our own employees and the risks that may be maybe for them, but also with a lot of customers coming in, especially in the builders merchant sites, a lot of retail customers coming in. So it's quite a complicated operation in terms of the health and safety side of things. So as I said, there's been a change in leadership. Katie and I have come into the business um, and obviously for us that's additional responsibility. And I think therefore there's been a change in focus for us and we've, we've reviewed all aspects of the business. Um, and today I'm going to focus on those that relate specifically to health and safety. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, the presentation is about this transition from what I'll call old dogs, old tricks, which is the, uh, I best be careful because my mum was the uh, previous uh, owner of the company, but uh, <laughs> that was the previous regime, sort of up to not to 50 years. Uh, and then now looking forward with Katie and I going into the future, the new dog and the new tricks and, and how we balance that. So in terms of our ambition for the business, we want to maintain the family values, we want to maintain a family business. We want to achieve growth, but it's got to be sustainable, there's no massive expansion plan. Um, we want to offer quality service and products because we'll never be able to compete with the national guys on price or volumes, and therefore our niche is about service. So that's, that's absolutely paramount to our business. Um, and ultimately we want to improve profitability. Now I guess the question is, what on earth has this got to do with today and, and how does it link into safety? Now, we're quite passionate about the benefits of a safe place of work and we've listed a number of the reasons why. I think ultimately, it's important everybody goes home in one piece. I think there's links to good housekeeping. I think a safe place is generally a clean, a tidy and an inviting place, which is obviously very important because we've got to consider the retail aspect of our business. Um, there's definitely links to improved product quality, as well as sort of general levels of efficiency and damage and throughput and so on. Um, ultimately, the customer experience as well, a good quality environment is appealing uh, to, to customers. And obviously, there's employee morale as well. That's important to us. And as I said before, all of this, we think, boils down ultimately into improved profit, which is essentially why we're in business. So the question is, what happens when it goes wrong? Well, we had a fatality within our quarrying business in the mid-90s. Um, I was much younger at the time. I was just starting senior school. Um, but I remember it quite well. There was obviously the, the utter devastation for this guy's family. Um, there was a massive impact on my own family. My parents had to go and tell his family what had happened. Um, and obviously there was an impending investigation, although in this case it was an act of God, but there still is the, the massive worry that goes with it all. Um, the remaining employees were also traumatised and a number had to leave. They couldn't continue working having seen what they'd seen. Um, there was obviously damage to the business and the reputation. Um, and I think the other thing um, to note is that attitudes within that business sort of changed overnight. We've got other businesses within the group where I think the view is oh, it's never happened to me I'm all right whereas in the quarry I think 
it is much easier to push through change and, and promote safety because they've seen what can happen. And I think for those very reasons, it's probably why Katie and I are so passionate about safety, because we don't ever want to have to go through that again. So, the old dog's old tricks. I think the general view before we came into the business was everything was okay. Um, Mum and uncle had built a, a quality business um, with, um, it was, it was a well resourced, it was, um, it had a good reputation. Um, we'd assembled, or they'd assembled a fantastic bunch of people. Um, but like a lot of independent, smaller companies, um, everything was okay, but perhaps the paperwork and some of the systems weren't where they should be. So Katie and I came in and thought, this must be easy, let's just get the paperwork sorted and we'll plough on. Um, and so we tried to, we tried to do this. Um, we got one or two people in just to help us get up to speed as it were. Um, but we soon found out that we weren't making any progress and things weren't happening and we're coming up an, against a number of issues. So the initial question was, why can't we move the health and safety forward? Why are we getting all these barriers and so on? And what became clear was because we were so inexperienced in the early days, um, we didn't necessarily know what the problem was. So what we did, we decided to go and get some advice and some expertise into the business to support us in the areas where we were weakest. And I best mention him is here today, but we've got Rob Shaw in from Safety Coaching and he's, he's helped us, as have a number of other people. Um, and I think one of the things they encouraged us to go and do was to go and look for ourselves and not believe necessarily what our senior management or management were telling us or what we'd assumed was happening. And so when we went out and got involved and went to speak to the guys at the sites and so on, we found that things were, were different in reality than what we'd hoped or assumed or whatever. Um, I think as, as Roy touched on, we've always had a, a really good relationship with our staff. We know them all first name terms, we know the family members. Um, so we, we always have dialogue, we're constantly talking. But I think what was clear was that we were just talking about the weather, the football, the business, the recession. But safety never really featured in those conversations. Um, and that's something I'll come on to, that we've, we've tried to change. Again, I'd assumed wrongly um, that things were being done when in reality they weren't. And I guess that applies to all of us and all aspects of our role. I think it is important that you go out there and you check that things are actually happening. Also, obviously, the economic situation has had a massive impact on, on our business, as I'm sure it has everybody in here. We've had to reduce the costs and, and the resource and so on, and therefore that has impacted on safety as it has on all aspects of the business. And I think one of the other things that you do get with this family business and this transition between generations, Katie and I have, have tried to build a management team to support us, and this has sort of coincided with the previous... Um, regime as it were, coming to retirement age and I think unwittingly we lost a lot of experience during that period uh, and we've had to try and catch up um, over the last year or two. So in terms of the initial mistakes we made, in terms of just thinking that we could just tick the box and get on with it, um, we struggled massively to get any sort of employee buy-in uh, and I think because we're young and impatient we attempted to do everything overnight sort of ram it through and uh, just assumed everybody would get on with it. Um, I think the approach was wrong as well. We're a practical business with a lot of hands-on people and one of the worst examples I saw was um, a 15-page document, all text on how to report or fill in an accident book. And our guys got this and sort of saw it and thought, well, this is no bloody use to me. I need, I need somebody to explain it to me properly, how, how I do things. So the approach wasn't right. And that isn't to say that I don't think that documents are right in certain businesses, but it, for our people in our business, that, that wasn't the right approach at the time. I think the other thing as well, the procedures were issued and forced upon people sort of via email rather than sort of developed together uh, and, and they weren't communicated as, as they should have been. And I think generally we found that when we got out there and spoke to people, they were all left feeling confused um, and sort of didn't know which way it was up. And it wasn't that they were intentionally not helping us push through this change, it was that they genuinely didn't understand. And said before, I think coming into the business, Katie and I sort of saw the health and safety as a bit of a box ticking exercise and ultimately something that you just need to do, get that done, and as I say, move on. And in reality, it, it isn't that. We've learned that. We learned that pretty quickly. Um, 
And I'm going to go on to, 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 to why that isn't the case and what we've done about it. So one of the diagrams we showed fairly recently, and I think this is quite key to our business, was, was this one for competence. How a competent person has a balance of knowledge, experience and skill. And if we've got those in, in reasonably similar quantities, where it comes together in the middle, we have a competent person. Now what we had, because we're a long established family business, we've lots of people who have been here for more than 30 years. So we've got, they've got massive amounts of experience using that piece of kit or, 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 or serving that type of customer or whatever it is. But because we're a smaller business, we didn't necessarily have the systems in place or the resource available to train the people up as a lot of you guys in this room will have in, in the much bigger national companies. And therefore, there was probably an imbalance between experience, skill and knowledge, which is something we've had to address fairly sharpish. And in reality, I guess you could say that some of those people weren't as competent as we thought. Just because they've been there for 30 years doesn't necessarily mean they're competent. So, we, we looked at everything that went before, we got our fresh ideas and I think we realised there was a middle ground. So we made various changes um, to try and move us forward and I think there's five major areas. One is in terms of the culture of the business, two was the management style and approach, three was training, four was the reporting and investigation of incidents and five uh, sort of physical improvements were made. So in terms of the culture, we've really been trying to push this safety culture. It's not a box ticking exercise. It's not something we have to do. It is a benefit to everybody in the business and ultimately the business as a whole. Um, and as I say, we've, we've tried to drive this alongside the housekeeping, um, or pushing the housekeeping as well, because I think they come hand in hand. Um, we've tried to make everybody responsible and get away from this sort of view that oh, it's only the health and safety advisor or it's only a line manager that's responsible for safety. So we've, as I say, we've, tr we've tried, to, um, tried to make everybody feel responsible and, and point out that it's not just about keeping yourself safe, it's the guy next to you, it's everybody on the site, it's the customers. Um, one of the things that Roy touched on, we've introduced a safety committee, by the sounds of it we're a bit late, but we thought we were leading the way here. Um, <laughs> and what we've done... 12 years. <laughs> we, um, we wanted to give everybody a say, so the idea is... As directors of the company, we are wanting to drive this change from the top down. But I think it's important that we don't go and fall into those initial mistakes and we encourage the ideas from the bottom up. So we've assembled a safety committee and on that committee are directors of the business and then various uh, levels of management and so on. And we also have yard staff and drivers on that same panel. And we sit down once a month to discuss policy changes, incidents that have occurred, best practice and so on. And we try and encourage that to be as informal and open as possible so that we do genuinely get or make people feel comfortable that they can speak up and we can encourage these ideas. Um, and I think that that has been a real success uh, for us. Um, and that has also helped us to spread the message to the, to the wider business because there's nothing like hearing it from your colleague as opposed to listening to a presentation from one of the directors. That, that, that's really helped. So those, those drivers and, and yard lads who have, who have been there seeing what we're trying to achieve. I think if, if they can help sell the message, then that, that makes a massive difference. In terms of the culture as well, we're trying to make the point that things need to be done for the right reason. It's not about a blame culture. It's not just a box ticking exercise. It's genuinely in a, about making the workplace safer and improving the business. Um, we've gone for very much a risk-based approach to safety. Um, we can only do so much. We've only got so much money and therefore we've highlighted the areas of highest risk and we can tackle those first. The other thing here, sound pretty obvious to, to most people, this empowerment and personal responsibility. But in a family business, which you're extremely passionate about, it's so easy to fall into the mistake of micromanaging, getting involved in all the tasks and before you know where you are, you're doing them all yourself and it's this I'm in the trench digging and everybody else is watching sort of thing. And so what we've tried to do is empower people, give them responsibility. This A gets them to buy in, but also it frees up the senior management to time to allow us to, to drive the culture and the strategy, which is probably what we were missing before. 
So that's quite important that we're free to, to, to help develop this safety culture. And the other thing, um, which we didn't necessarily do as well as we could have done, was to celebrate sort of personal site performance and improvements and promote them. And we're doing that through that safety committee, um, which, which seems to be working so far. So I touched on the management style um, before. One of the things that we found was that we'd got two or three people into the business to help us um, on health and safety initially, as, as well as other things. Um, but they weren't the right people and they weren't getting the message across. So we've, we've got people into our management teams now, assuming they're competent, but we've selected them beyond that based purely on their people skills and their ability to embrace change because there's so many of these experienced people who couldn't embrace change and therefore you'll never move things forward. But equally, if you haven't got people skills, you can't communicate the messages to the workforce and that's just as bad. <coughs> We're also trying to run health and safety as a group function because we had an imbalance of, of standards. Um, obviously, the quarry is out of all our businesses is leading the way, and I think that's because of, um, sort of the mines and quarries influence and also the fact that there was a bad accident, see what happens. Whereas within the builders, merchants and the ready mix side of things, it was perhaps not quite where it should be. So by trying to run it as a group function, we're trying to raise all the standards up to best practice. Um, and we've also insisted that the managers are more visible and approachable. So it's important, and that applies to directors of the company as well, that we get out there, we seem to be accountable, and we're also seen to be leading safety and driving it from the front. Um, the other slight change in terms of the management as well is that we've had to use disciplinary procedures and a stronger approach where necessary. Now this isn't something that comes natural in a family business because like I said before we know them on first name terms, we see them outside of work from time to time so it is more difficult, they aren't just numbers um, but we have used um, a much stronger approach especially in the areas that relate to safety. Um, as I say it's only in a minority of cases but it's something that um, we, we are using now and I think it also sends out a message to, to everybody else that we're serious about this. So in terms of training, how do we bridge that gap between the, the competence diagram I showed you? How do we get the skill and knowledge up to, up to speed? Well, first thing we did, an immediate stop to issuing procedures and instruction via email because a lot of our people haven't got access to emails and a lot of them that have probably don't read them anyway. So that wasn't working. So we've gone for this toolbox talk approach for as much of this as we possibly can and, and sort of presentations. And this seems to be better suited to our, to our workforce and we seem to be getting much better engagement. We're going for an interactive approach where possible. So if it is, say, training on, on something like isolation, we get a, uh, an electrical panel in and look at some of the isolation devices, the padlocks and clamps and all that sort of stuff. And then we can have a, pr a practical demonstration as well as just a theory-based thing or just a series of pictures. And the other thing that, we've, that um, our new safety advisor is doing for us, he sort of insists after completing the toolbox talk, we go to that piece of kit or that piece of plant with the operators um, to go through it again to make sure that they do fully understand and to check that actually this thing can be isolated, <laughs> that there aren't modifications required and so on, because that's happened in a lot of cases for us. Um, and I think this more interactive approach as well has helped to generate more interest, better employee buy-in and also a wider discussion on other safety related issues, but also other issues within the business, whether it be quality or or good best practice or whatever. So it really has been quite positive as this. I think out of all the things we've done, this more laid back approach and uh, more interactive approach has really, uh, has really worked. And, and the feedback I've got from our guys is that they've, they've thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, and the other thing as well, it might sound obvious, but to include everybody, it's not just the operator of that machine, it's anybody who might come into contact with it or maintain it or feed it or whatever. So that's important that we include everybody in the training. Reporting investigation. I think this is something that potentially we were particularly weak on, not within the quarrying side of the business, but within the other areas where um, there wasn't the same focus on this sort of stuff. So we've issued several sort of company golden rules, as it were, and one of them is that all incidents must be reported now. Um, we're then making sure that we investigate the incident with all stakeholders, and this is where uh, our safety team come in. Um, and we're also 
trying to uh, issue some actions so that if there has been a, an incident, we try and stop it from happening again. Um, we're also sending out incident alerts internally because we have a lot of sites that do similar things and therefore if something's happened on one site it's important that we warn everybody else as to why it's happened and what we can do to prevent it happening again. And we're also having a personal involvement ourselves because it's important that we investigate them in the right manner, we don't go down this blame culture route, it's done in a constructive manner and also that we are genuinely actioning things and we, and we are moving it forward, it's not just, uh, just a paperwork exercise. Just got an example here of one of the incident alerts we issued fairly recently. We've, we've bought in some new timber within our merchanting business. It's some cheaper timber that the customers are, are after. Cheaper to buy, but it's a poorer quality and therefore it, doesn't, it hasn't been packaged as well and it's much more difficult to stack. And we had an example here where the guy had stacked it too high, he'd come out with a fork truck and, and the timber had fallen over. So we've put this incident alert out internally, explaining the root cause of the problem and also various uh, action points um, and then we gave this particular guy um, the necessary training and so on um, and obviously sat down with him and, it, and went through what had happened. Going back to the disciplinary thing, in this particular case this guy couldn't be helped and a few days later he did something similar so unfortunately he's no longer with us. So we, are, we did have to, to act on that one but as I say we're trying to do it in as constructive a way as possible to again get some better buy-in. Um, and the other thing as well, physical improvements. We are trying to spend money where we need to. Again, there are massive uh, financial restraints on us in this market, but we are, we are wanting to spend money. We want to be seen to be doing this. Um, ad but again, this is, this is uh, on a risk-based um, risk basis. So obviously, the areas where we think there's potential most risk, we're spending the money first. The other thing I've put down here is shock and awe. We've done something fairly basic, which is to insist that any employee who goes outside in our builders' merchants' yards has to wear a high-vis vest. Now, that sounds fairly simple, and it's common practice in the quarrying side of things, but it isn't in the builders' merchants. It's not something that anybody else does. And there's two reasons we did this. One was because of, obviously, the, the number of traffic movements in the yards, but also because we wanted to get people talking about the safety culture and get everybody involved in, in this sort of transition and so on and um, doing this obviously grabbed everybody's attention thought oh this is different why are we doing it and then that again creates that discussion so that was something that we did um, that although it wasn't top of the list in terms of risks and so on it was the reason was to try and to get everybody's attention and finally we've also invested in a new computer system to help on the the system side of things so um, training records um, accident reporting risk assessments and that sort of stuff and, th and that helps us become more consistent also across all the group, across all the businesses. So here I've got some pictures on the good, the bad and the ugly within our business. Now this is a picture of our latest branch that we opened within the, the Builders Merchants and I hope you can sort of see from the picture that Katie and I are really trying to push this customer experience. So we've gone for something that resembles more of a shop than a Builders Merchants yard. Because there's, there's no reason why a Builders Merchants yard has to be. Um, uninviting and, and dirty and stuff everywhere. So you can see here, well lit building, heated building, everything's um, stacked neatly, stacked safely, um, very inviting. So that's our customer facing view that we're pushing for at the minute. But then on a different site, just down the road, we've got um, this area at the back of one of our workshops where clearly this, this concept of a good culture, good housekeeping isn't embedded and it wasn't embedded and therefore it wasn't happening everywhere and so we've got here a bit of a dumping ground said it was massively unsafe but you can see it's a mess um, half the bits are there we probably won't be able to find when we need them so we'll just buy new ones so we did the housekeeping presentation with these particular guys and sat down and explained why we wanted them to tidy that up we didn't just issue excuse my language of bollocking but we we sat down with them and explained the importance of this and how it linked to this this wider culture and since then, it's looking a lot better. Things are stacked properly and so on. And as I say, this, this seems fairly simple, but I think this is actually key to improving this culture and getting people to buy in. Now, I don't know whether I should show this one, but I am going to. We've got 
Um, a grinder here on the left, you can see the guards being removed. And also, um, there's a ladder abandoned in the middle of it. The signs are all over the place. And again, I think this goes down to this culture of we've been doing it this way for a long time and complacency is set in here in this particular environment. Um, and obviously this isn't acceptable, but again, we sort of sat down with them and explained why we're doing this, what it's, what it's all about. And since then, things are better. The signs are up, the guards are back on, the ladder's away. Um, and I think people hopefully understand why. I, I don't honestly believe that they're going behind our backs saying, I'm just going to do that so I, don't, so I don't get pulled up again. I think they're generally bought into it. And you can see it spread throughout the workshop and throughout that particular site. So that's been really positive down there. They were probably furthest behind where they should have been, but we've managed to achieve some, some buy-in. And it, it's just spreading now. And we don't have to say anything else. It's just happening. You can see the improvements all the time. There's also a sweeping brush down there. I'm reliably informed that is used from time to time. And a final example here. This was a notice board in one of our foyers for our central distribution site for our merchants. As you can see, it's, um, it's fairly sparse. I should imagine most of the stuff on there is out of date. So we've replaced it with, with this now. We've got this health and safety notice board, which is something which we've, we've recently introduced. And we've got this in every one of our buildings. And on here, there's obviously the insurance documents, company health and safety policy, the core rules and so on. But you can see on the bottom, we've also got our incident alerts so that everybody can see them for those who haven't got access to emails and so on. And also the minutes from the safety committee meetings we have so that people who aren't at the committee meetings can see what we've discussed, who was there. And as part of that, we also put in the best practice so that we're trying to share the ideas and, and, and promote this. So in terms of the results then, um, of these changes. I think health and safety is now talked about by everyone. I'm not saying it's all good, but it's definitely talked about by everybody. It's starting to become more embedded, certainly in, in, the, in the ready mix and the merchanting side where it was, where it was further behind the quarry. We are able to achieve more consistent standards across the group. I think people are safer at work. Well, I'm sure they are. Um, People have left. Some people were unable to embrace a change and therefore clearly couldn't come with us on this journey. Um, and others have been demoted. Those who felt that they couldn't, they couldn't cope, they couldn't manage this, and therefore they've gone back to, to a doing job rather than a managing job, which is better for, for both sides, if you like. We're focusing on uh, recruiting quality replacements. Um, I think that's obviously important that we get the best possible people. Um, but one of the things I would note here is that our number of reported incidents has gone through the roof. Now, I wouldn't say that that was because we were any more dangerous than we were 12 months ago, but I think it's because everybody is now um, conscious of, of, of this. Um, and some of these things are potentially would have been swept under the carpet previously. But we're trying to encourage everybody to report everything, to highlight the issues so that we can at least have a go at tackling them. Um, obviously that, that, um, that potentially could be an issue for us, but, but we think it's worth, it's worth that. So future aspirations for us as a business. We wanted to continue on this journey for improving the competency of the workforce. We'd like to try and achieve 100% employee buy-in. We're determined to continue to do things for the right reasons, and that is to make it a safer environment and a better business for no other reason. And obviously, again, avoid this blame culture. Um, ultimately, we're constantly trying to improve the leadership quality, and that stems from me down. Um, I think if you want a good business, then you need good leaders and good management. That's key. Um, and again, I think this all boils down to the best possible customer service, which we feel we can steal a march on the nationals, because I think with the cuts that have happened through the, the current recession, the national service has definitely suffered and although the prices have dropped which makes it more difficult for us we can still achieve higher prices and win some work um, on the back of this customer service people are still definitely willing to pay a bit more for good service and, and that's ultimately what our business is about so just final slide from me what have I learned 
Well, I've learned it is all about communication. If you can't communicate your message, you have no chance. Um, and that's something that, that we're constantly trying to build on. Everybody's got a contribution to make, no matter what you do or where you are. Um, as tempting as it is, I don't think you should disregard everything that went before. It wasn't all wrong, it was just slightly different, so that there is a balance. You can't change things overnight, again, it's frustrating when you wanted to move the business forward, but it does take time. Um, and I think one of the things for me that was probably quite difficult was going with your gut feeling. I haven't got the experience that a lot of you guys have got, so it's quite easy to be swayed, but I think if you think it's the right thing to do, you've just got to plough on and do it. And finally, I think you've just got to do what you say you're going to do, because if you don't, and you don't move things forward, then you, you lose face soon, and, and the whole thing sort of falls by the wayside. Um, so that's it from me, really. Um, so I'm giving you an overview of, of what we've been doing. Hopefully Richard isn't going to shut us down of those pictures um, but as I say if you've got any questions please please fire them at me you might be local authority yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you James uh, once again for a stimulating presentation it's nice to see the younger element willing to stand up here in front of us all lags and put forward their point of view and I'm sure it's promoted some questions. Does anybody would like to ask, ask James a question? I'd just like to say I was extremely impressed by the presentation. It was uh, yeah. brilliant. That. Um, just noted that uh, you managed to uh, demote people uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, but perhaps they've been promoted beyond their competence. Yes. And how did uh, that go down and uh, what, did, what difficulties did you come across in, in doing so? Well, I think um, being a family business and my sister does the HR side of things within our business, so we haven't got the same constraints that you guys will have in the same system. So we're very fortunate that in some cases um, we don't have all this sort of legislation to work around. We do obviously have employment legislation, but we're free to make um, sort of quicker decisions and so on. Um, but I think in a lot of cases what we found, these people weren't comfortable in those positions. So when you actually sit down with them and have a frank discussion and explain where the business is going, how it is going to become more onerous being a manager within the Myers Group looking forward, they sort of, I think, acknowledge the fact that they weren't necessarily up to it, they weren't comfortable with it, and it was a relief on both parties that they could go back to the tools as it were. And um, with, with a couple of guys at the minute who are like different people, now they've been able to sort of ditch the management side of things, which they got by default, whether it was because they've been here a long time. or um, and, and so they've, they've sort of stepped back, and I think they've, they're, they're, they're enjoying their new roles, and we can get the right people in. So I think in a lot of cases, um, people didn't necessarily want to be doing the jobs they were doing. Certainly, certainly. Thank you for that. Is there any more questions for James? Nice and easy. I will tell you that uh, uh, when I was with Tarmac, we took over a company, um, and I went down there as the Tarmac first manager, and they didn't realise who Tarmac was because Tarmac weren't in that area, and I had the same problem. It is not a new problem. Yeah. It has been going on for years. We take over places, we go in, and the biggest thing is the previous occupier might not have given them anything. The first thing we did was give them PPE. We gave them 25 years awards for the people who'd worked for more than 25 years. But we couldn't get them to buy into the tarmac system because it wasn't their company, if you know what I mean. Um, and. I fully understand what you say as regards to a family business, because that was a family business taken over by a bigger company. <coughs> and the family business was always better than a bigger company. And I understand the problems that you face, because I faced them many years ago. Are there any more questions? Or have, uh, are you all made copious notes, and you'll phone him later <laughs> to ask him how he's done it? <laughs>
Thank you.